I'm going to get fired, even though it would have been the better decision for my team. And that's how most companies are still run. Status quo. Because that's how it was when I was being taught as a manager. So that's what I'm going to be to there. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Leads to Growth. Uh, I'm your host, Chris McCoy, and we're with the National Association of Sales Professionals. And today we've got a uh, special guest with a little bit of a niche market here that we, we talked about just recently, uh, the real estate, Joseph Rocky Jr. Thank you for being here, Joe. Well, thank you for having me. Yeah. My man. So Joe has a podcast called uh, Joe and Me. Father and Joe. Father and Joe. I, I knew it was something and something here. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, yeah. And, and Joe actually has a great story because, uh, you know, considering the current market that we're in right now, the, the radical real estate market, all the things that are changing, uh, the potential of, of a recession in loom. Uh, Joe is a person that uh, when we had our last uh, a bubble crunch in, in 2008, uh, I believe was doing some things in finance at the time mm -hmm. and then decided to re uh, take, take a shift and shift into a new direction and started a career in real estate, uh, property management, renovation, different things like that. Correct, Joe? He's going to tell us a little bit more about that. that. Yeah. Um, but the reason I wanted to bring this to y'all today is because I know a lot of our audience here, not only are whether they're a successful salesperson or look for ways to uh, to grow a side business or to generate some additional revenue or to direct some of those funds that they're making. Uh, also, some people out there that are looking to, to, to take advantage of a different idea of work. Um, you know, a lot of people leaving corporate America looking to start their own business. Uh, real estate market is is shifting all over the country. It's very unique right now. And uh, Joe, very excited to have you here. So tell us a little bit about uh, about how you got here in, in, in that transition, where you started before 2008 and what maybe happened during that time. And what were some of the big decisions uh, that were made to get you to the place that you are today? Sure. So so in 08 was was my senior year of college. That, that was getting the degree. So uh, I got a degree in accounting and finance and then a graduation know, present. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, basically I realized very early on, I needed skills, you know, people get paid upon skills, not upon theories. So the thing that I realized was, well, let's find a skill that's universal to everything. You know, I could become a Marine biologist, but then I'm basically limited to this industry. So what skills were applicable to all professions, all businesses, period? And the two that I came down upon, really three at the end of the day, um, was accounting. Every business needs to know where their money's at, period. You need to know where it's at. You need to know how to get more money. That's basically yes. what finance is. And the second way you get more money is through sales, which is Ooh, the yes. best way to get more money. So every job I basically had during college, during all the internship world, um, was in sales. Uh, because to, to give the, the three little nuggets there. And I was offered good positions at the various accounting houses. And, you know, me being me at the time, I said no, trying to hold out for the absolute best one. And this was in November before everything really started breaking. And there's people in my class who obviously accepted the various spots. And then in you know, March or whatever, they're starting to get rescind letters and saying, you know, we know we gave this to you, but it doesn't really exist anymore. And during that period, I kind of realized I messed up, but it didn't matter anyway, because everyone was in the same boat I was at. <laughs> so I ended up taking a sales position, um, selling life insurance and annuities, because they mm. will always hire people that will go out and sell stuff. And that, that's anyone that can knock on them doors, man. I did some time. Exactly. A anyone that can sell anything, basically. So that's what I did. And the first year I was the rookie of the year. Second year I was underclassman. Third year I left. And part of the reason I left was uh, I was working 80 hours a week. And Oof. yeah, um, that'll do it. There's a lot of stupid roles in what made me work 80 hours a week. One of which being that if I got a check, it had to be overnighted that day and it had to be in the bin by 5 30 in the morning so if you're selling at a place because i drove to all my clients that was three hours away from that particular bin mm. um it was i'd have to drive back rather than stopping at any single ups box along the way um so a lot of just bad processes there so long story short you get that mindset of i don't really want to do this anymore let's figure out an option and I started exploring what were, were different possibilities. And I ended up sitting in the back of a real estate meeting and I'm, I'm looking around at all these guys and none of them were working as long as me. 
Uh, most of them were making vastly more money than me and all of them were having a better standard of life than me. So I was like, well, this is pretty straightforward. How do we get into this? And my whole goal from the beginning was I wanted to have residual income Mm -hmm. uh, because I realized from selling all the life insurance annuities that retirement is not a big pile of money game. Retirement is a stream of income game. And if you have enough income that will last forever it doesn't matter how long you live. If you have a big pile of money, you live too long, you can outlive it. That's pro. No, and you know, I think that's the thing too, is that the, the idea of, it was the same idea in the past, but our only way to get that monthly income was to have a pile of money that then got paid out in mm-hmm. a residual way. Exactly. And now, and now because of the way that the world has changed, because of connectivity, because of information, because of all these different things, there are now different ways to rework that old model. Exactly. So, um, you know, so that's how, yeah, I want residuals, so, I love it. but I didn't have enough money and or enough clout with the banks to be able to just go buy a rental, refinance and buy a rental. You can do that once you're mature and that's what we do now. But at the beginning, we didn't really have that capability because sure. we didn't already have the established stream of revenue from the other properties. So what I started with was doing flips and basically to given very broad strokes is you buy a house for less than it's worth. You then fix it up and then you sell it for what it's worth. Uh, And then hopefully throughout the process, there was enough profit left over to make it worthwhile for the vast majority of people that is not attainable. Um, It's like 97% of the people that do the first flip, never do another one because they lost money. And Uh. And oftentimes a lot of money. And there's a lot of different reasons that lead into that. Uh, what certainly does not help is the TV channels that show all of these flipping shows. Uh, one key thing needs to be noted that's different than them and the rest of society is they're getting paid per episode. And oftentimes it's the TV budget is how they're making their money and not the houses. Um, so the other part is they don't need to be necessarily truthful in the numbers they put on their TV um, in terms of what it actually costs to do that. Sure. So, um, those two yeah, factors. The, 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 really I imagine. Focused. I imagine you get a lot better cost and trade for your uh, for your labor services when uh, when they're going to be featured on a TV program. Exactly. <laughs> so so when you think of it like that, that that's a, a big part of why. The other part is people just think it's easy um, to to just hire a couple of guys and, and make it work. And don't get me wrong. That, that's I thought it would be straightforward that adults would be like adults and they would do what they would say and. One of the things I learned very quickly is that wasn't the case and mm-hmm. how to learn those skills to get over it. And that, that takes time. There's just no way around it. Um, you know, especially if you're coming from a world where you're basically able to control everything. I think of lawyers, particularly when I'm talking about this, that you can control every little microcosm in your world. And as long as you make someone settle, you're good, which basically means you're dealing with adults, except for the people who are squabbling, but the other people you're dealing with the settlements where our adult to adult conversations, lawyers talking to lawyers. Um, when you're hiring your employee. And, w- and when you say adult to adult, I, I assume you like, it's a, it's like an equal, equal standard of, of values and, and, and expectations, right? Like we're, we're going to, we're going to play by this set of rules that we've all agreed upon. And, and, and then that's, that's the conversation of an adult to adult. Yes. And also that the people will do the very basic things. They'll show up on time when they're supposed to. They'll keep their word. They have a standard, a basic set of values that you've all agreed upon. Yes. Yes. All of that, which um, is important. That does not really live in the world of people who are being um, laborers for a crew. Um, In general, um, not not to, to, to pair all of them, but in general, you end up being on a work crew where you don't get paid much because you're doing manual labor because something didn't work out in the rest of your life. Um, Normally it's something self-inflicted and it involves drugs or alcohol, but a lot of time it is the in-between world. It's a transition world. A lot of the times. Yes. Yeah. Sometimes. Um, But it often catches everyone's at the bottom. That doesn't really feel like coming up. I get enough here to go live in the bar and that's what I'm going to do. And that's a part of life. So that's obviously different than the adult adult standard that we just discussed. So for some people, that transition is very difficult to do. And another reason why it's, it's hard to do flipping. 
So the variables that you have to deal with are, are a lot higher in this industry because you're not hiring a marketing firm. You're not hiring um, a, an attorney uh, who's bound by a set of standards and practices that they have to abide by. You're hiring um, three or four guys who uh, will be at the bar tonight and this weekend and learned a few carpentry skills. Exactly. And, and the other part is, is when you're hiring these marketing firms, you know, there's a track record. They've been around. Right. A lot of yeah. these guys create a new entity every 10 minutes sure. for various reasons, but mostly it's because they don't want to get sued for something they messed up in the past, um, which as a result, that's just a thing that goes with real estate. There's not right. a lot of regulation in this, in, in this arena. It depends upon what state you live in. There's not okay. a lot of congressional regulation. It, it, this is one of the very few things that the federal government lets each state figure out themselves okay. um, in, in terms of, of commerce type stuff. So um, there, there's regulation when it comes time to dealing with the banks getting involved, like when the guy needs to get the mortgage to buy the house from you. Sure. Uh, but until that point from you buying the house with your money or, or some hard money loan, um, until that point, there's a lot of however your local municipality or state determines it. And How do you? Local, okay, go oh, ahead. Sorry, go yeah, go ahead, please. The local building inspector is, is, is the guy who has the most direct power on you. And depending upon which municipality he's in or, or however your area divides it, that's Pennsylvania doesn't pay any municipalities. Um, h- however, that guy is, it, it, it dictates your life, essentially. Sure. So, so, all right. So I, there's a lot of variables. Um, mm-hmm. We get that there, there's um, you're dealing with a world of people responsible for that aren't necessarily responsible for themselves. So this is, this is definitely a place where you're going to have to maintain an internal motivation at all times. Correct, yes. Joe. Yes. Uh, so where, where does sales come in, in your conversation? Where, where do you do the most selling? Um, Cause I know a lot of people are going to go, all right, well, Hey, Maybe I don't know all the things about the building world. Uh, I don't know all the things. I, I would imagine you have to, how do you, one, where does sales come in? And the sex, second question is, all right, once you leverage that great sale of, scales, how, of sales, how do you mitigate some of the other risks of where maybe you can't have all the knowledge and experience? So uh, in the flipping world, and, and really, I guess, in all real estate in general, the real money is made at your acquisition. If you bought the house at a low enough rate, it doesn't matter how bad you are at every other skill. If you bought the house low enough, it will eventually work itself out. Uh, it's just, can you get to that low of a safety net with getting the other person to agree? And at the end of the day, that's really what sales is. Can you get two people to agree to trade a product for uh, for for cash? And most people look at what I'm saying and goes, well, that's not sales. That That's, that's acquisitions. I'm not. I go, no, it's not. It's sales. Just because I'm giving the person my money instead of giving them the product does not mean it's not sales. Um, So, so in in the flipping world, that's there, obviously in the rental world, it's, it's both. I I am actually giving people the product um, for, for the rental. So what I say with that is the same skill sets you use to get someone to buy a product for a higher price, which is what all of us salespeople who can make our own prices are called to do. Um, those exact same skills are directly applicable to someone to sell you something for a lower price. Um, you know, we, we all kind of can figure out the consumer side of it instinctually. I don't want to pay that much, or I'd rather buy this because it's more convenient for me. Um, you know, I paid more for stuff on Amazon than it would if I would have driven down the street to pick it up right now. Because I didn't want to leave my house. Um, sure. now, was that the best economic decision? No. But was it what I wanted at the time? Yes. So knowing the different motivations that have led people to sell to in your sales experience is the direct same thing with the acquisitions. So really, I make my money on, on, on the purchase up front. And that's where the majority of my infrastructure is built into. The majority of my time in my life is looking at new properties to find the right ones I want, because it's a lot easier to buy 1% of the houses and get a great value than looking at five houses and knowing you have to buy two, because then you're basically dealt with whatever you get. Yeah. If you're constantly hunting, you can be really selective. But it's a lot on the due diligence up front. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah. And really knowing what, what does a good investment look like? 
Mm -hmm. Right. Because you, you, you may get a low value or a low price on a house, but but that may not be a, still may not be the same as a good investment of a, of a house. You may pay a little bit more for somewhere else. But knowing what what is going to make for a good investment takes some some research and some time. It takes experience. Yeah. 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 And, you know, for me, I'm over a decade plus of of experience of having done this. So that's a big part of it, too, is, you know, you know just because a house costs 20 grand doesn't mean it's going to be worthwhile. You're right, because. You have to know what it'll be worth. You have to know what you'll be able to get for it in rent if you're going down the rental route. Um, you know, you have to know what a bank's going to appraise it for on, on your uh, reappraisal when it comes time to, to getting your capital back to going doing this again. So all of those are different. Are, those are three distinct different skill sets um, that are very important to know if you want to be able to scale your business, which is the most important part of it is to be able to scale it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and I would even I would even beg to differ with you. I would say more so your, your, your skill is in negotiations, uh, you know, which is which is a, a sliver of sales. Right. It's just, just yeah. fine tuning it a little bit. Uh, and, and it's that negotiation because, I mean, really, if, if, if you think about it, it's not it's not the last. Right. Because there's never there's the last. But you're one of the last, you know, high level, high cost transactional um, purchases that are still out there, uh, even mm -hmm. um. Uh, even a, hold on one second. The dogs get crazy. Sorry. I got, got my coworkers here getting wild, you know, you'll have uh, that. <laughs> but, um, so you've got, uh, and they just threw me completely off track. Thanks guys. I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> but it, for, for what I think you were going with that, it, it's one of the last sales in life that can be completely negotiated. That is a high value sale. Like even yes. cars are becoming this. This is the sticker price, pay it or leave. Oh, oh yeah. Well, also yeah, it's a relationship too with the car now. Like right, it's been. I mean, now you even look there. Uh, what BMW is making you charging a subscription for heated seats in the future for their for their cars. So you know, like you're uh, when you buy an automobile, it's one of the most important purchases because it's it's so much your identity. It's so attached to your identity when you buy a home your family, where you're going to live, all these things are tied to it and identity because it's, it's about living in a place and a location. Mm -hmm. When you're buying an investment property, it's a high ticket item. You may never talk to that person you're having this negotiation with ever again. Probably not unless they're a another real estate player. But then I mess, I would imagine the negotiation is a little bit different in those times, correct? Yeah. So so I do both. So So because I'm going through so much volume of these properties, I recognize that there's a lot of people who can't, especially ones that want to be landlords. So one of the things that you mentioned before are those that want to have another stream of income, kind of have this as maybe even a side hobby or whatever. Yeah. So I have a lot of people in my life that are professionals, lawyers, surgeons, um, those kinds of guys that don't have the ability to be in a property at Thursday at two o'clock banging sure. on doors, but they know that they want to have it and they know they're not going to get it as a good of a price as I would get it. A, they're not as skilled as me, and B, they don't have the time to put into it. So what I do- And the is, risk that they have, because they, they, they don't know the research or the experience. Exactly. But they, they know the profile they want for their own business. You know, like I want to have things in this school district. I want X amount of bedrooms and my property manager will take care of it. And there's flaws in that logic, but uh, we can get into that later. But the core concept still exists that there are people that just have a general template of what they want because it's how they want their business to look. That that's the identity that they want to feel comfortable with. I'm in the good school district. I own stuff in the good school district. So when I go to the PTA meetings, I can say I own more property value than anyone else in here. And I'm special, you know, whatever. There's people that are like that. So what I do is, is, but again, they don't have the time to be in bounding all the doors and doing all the infrastructure it takes to be able to, see enough houses to get them there. So are they going to get the house at the same price I would get at? No. Um, but what I will do is I will buy the house and then I will get it to them um, where I get paid for my in-between services, but they get the house. They don't really have to ever spend time on the prospecting side of their world. They basically are getting move-in ready houses. So they don't need to spend time renovating it. Um, and some of them are automated enough where they have another guy that will do the property management for them. And on that note, I, I need to tell everyone this explicitly. If you are having someone be a property management um, company for you, do not pay them per transaction. Make them an equity partner in some capacity, whatever that means to you, whether you're giving them a 
cut of the commission or an actual ownership stake because those that get paid per transaction do not get you good long-term tenants. They get you tenants that they can churn so they can get paid for the next transaction. It's like the guy who cuts your grass, but cuts it at four inches instead of at two inches. Why? Because he knows you'll need him back quickly. Um, and that's how these property managers are. However, if you got them on a commission basis, again, that same kind of subscription model, they will then pick someone where they can put someone in there for a good long time. They get paid every month, make sure it's less than you get paid, but they get paid every month. And then they're going to find someone who's good quality and they make their money by having more quality people that they never need to think about again, which is the goal of being a successful landlord. Joe, so I, I love that. I mean, I love that. Good. You have something to finish there? Oh yeah. So, I mean, that's why I'd say find someone who's another landlord and partner with them rather than trying to hire a company that does the transactional analysis. I love that because I, I love the idea of, of equity sharing, you know, just as the concept alone, I think people are just more incentivized when they're a part of something as opposed to an employee of something. Um, and especially when you're talking about ownership, when that person is the extent, the, one of the only extensions of you to that house and the one looking after your investment, it just makes sense to have them look after their own investment as well. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that is, um, you know, that, that's a really, really great model for people to take note of out there. Um, you know, and, and I think that's a great model for us to look at in all areas of business, especially for sales. Look at, look at the way sales is pivoting right now. You know, you have commissions, you have a lot of these startup companies. Why, why do you get startup salespeople and everybody in your company to sell? It's because they're all going to get, they're all a part of the rev share. They're a part of the growth. They're a part of the company. And I think that when you can do that, when it makes sense, uh, and it does find a lot of ways in, in the real estate market, do it because that it's an abundant way of thinking. You may think, oh, I don't want to give away my share. Or I don't want to give away this piece, but in the long run, it's going to make you more money. Yeah. It's, it's how you scale. I mean, it's how you scale. Day, um, because it, you know, that's where a lot of people will, will cap themselves out is either a, they become too cheap on hiring people mm -hmm. um, and, and they don't want to have extra people in charge that are making decent money. Um, and, and, or they, they it's, it's the same equation it's set a different way they, they, they don't they want to hold on to too much of a small pie rather than letting it grow um and, and that that's a personality thing with some people and um you know you can get into a lot of things i, I know that you'd like to discuss more about sales and management but one of the shows i like watching is the bar rescue show where he okay. basically goes in talks to these owners and tries to fix their bar and i can tell at this point, just having been a business owner this long, within three minutes of his first conversation with the business owner, whether when they do the flashback at the end of this episode, whether it will have been implemented and successful, because you can just tell from someone about whether they're receptive to other people's ideas and want to implement them, or if they hear someone else's idea, they have to do the opposite and that will never see the light of day. Mm. And for the record, if you are the latter, you will never be successful, period. Um, there's no nice way to say that hundred um, percent. Um, you can be delusional with yourself and you can think that you can be on top of the, the mountain that's two inches tall, which is good for you, but you'll never be truly long-term successful. Joe, I, I love that. We're setting out a, a new newsletter here this week. And I think one of the topics is being curious. Uh, you know, we don't know what we don't know. And, and, and to think that, you know, everything right now is just foolish and, and it, it blinds you. The idea mm -hmm. is, um, you know, when you say, when someone says, oh, did you know about such a, oh yeah, yeah, I know. Once you say, I know your brain cuts you off from learning or receiving any more information in. So the idea of, yeah, it, it's a, it's a, a quiet, subtle thing. I know means I don't need to hear anymore. Mm. You've stopped listening. And so the idea is that, oh, listen, listen, we've got two ears, one mouth. That's the old, the old adage, right? Uh, and be curious that the idea is that when you were seven, your truth evolved right because you got more information yeah. when you're eight you got your more information when you're nine you got more information the more information that we get the more that we realize these old truths that we used to hold as as absolutes are not and so i, I love that uh, one if you want to scale you've got to you've got to find ways to bring other people into your wealth and growth uh mm -hmm. two you've got to be curious and never think that you know everything otherwise you'll be stuck behind everybody else those are two big lessons i'm taking from this joe Absolutely. And something you just told me there made me think about it. You know, so much of our society right now, maybe since at least as long as I can remember, maybe it's always been this way. Um, you can tell me if I'm wrong on this. Seems to be 
turning people into, into items that I don't need to listen to. So yes. you just gave an example there with, I know, but you know, just if you, if you look at, at the TV, the model is make the person who disagrees with you, someone that's not worthy to listen to. Um, and, and that puts, and that's really causing a lot of problems with this country that we have as a whole right now. Uh, but that's not the purpose of this, but in terms of is with the business world, uh, you have to be, you have to be willing to bring those people in, as you said, but the flaw that gets caught up in all of this is how do we compensate these people? Yes, you want to have them have a stake in the action um, where they get incentivized for having better results. That's that 100% needs to be true. But it also doesn't mean to be that you're giving them 50% of the pie either. Um, you can give a lot of people action where it can be you know molded in different ways there's lots of different ways to do compensation models and i'm always a fan of tying what they get paid for most directly to what you want them to do so say you own a hotel and you want to have your cleaning service you know have the best cleaning rooms but you also don't want them to take forever well you could just pay them a straight hourly rate which is what a lot of people do because it's easy and it's, that's the standard. It's easy. It's everyone doesn't work, but it's not effective. What will be much more effective is if you could say for the, every four cleaning people, there's going to be one evaluator might be a the cleaning person on a different floor. And you are going to get paid by a combination of the quality that you left this room and how many rooms you got done. So as long as you build your compensation correctly, people will have what you prefer more. They'll either will get more rooms done at an average rate or they'll get less rooms done at a super elite rate. And then you can compensate them. And most people, if your compensation is straightforward enough, which it should be, two variables, quality, time, they will figure out how to maximize their own wealth. And that is really what people will never do. And you think about this, for most places in this country, being a cleaning lady at a hotel is a minimum wage gig. So you might add up all the math and it get to pretty much $2 above minimum wage. But now you know the quality and the speed of your hotel is always right. And that's just a real quick example. But it's also something you can look at applicable to any business. A hundred percent. And I love that example because not only that, but, but you're making, you're, you're allowing somebody to be fulfilled by their work too. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think you're giving a, an employee an opportunity to be more fulfilled and feel like they're purposeful. They're, they're accomplishing something every day as opposed to just punching a clock. You know, and this conversation is very applicable because salespeople today, you know, one of the biggest challenges right now with SDRs and BDRs, sales development reps and business development reps is they're judged on a KPI. How many, how many emails did you send out today? How many messages did you send out today? Not what was the quality, not what was the return rate, response rate, but how many did you send out? And you can tell this is the truth because you can look at your inbox. You can look at your LinkedIn uh, DMs. And, I, and I've got hundreds, mm -hmm. on a, uh, thousands on a, probably on a weekly basis, generic cold solicitation that just comes through with, with paragraphs, with just stupid templates that, that are not original, that, that look like everybody else. That's just a bunch of white noise. And most of them, if I notice the brand that you're from, I, I won't ever look at you again because I'm just turned off. And so I, I think what you're saying is so, and, and this is translates to the same thing. That's why there's such churn in a lot of minimum wage employees. That's why it's hard for people to hire employees right now. Why? Because you're paying them, a, you're giving them a, a just enough to come in and do nothing, to come in yeah. and, 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 and not motivate them to, to, to do good, to do well, to get better. There's no incentive for that. And so I love what you're saying is, is, is create that incentive up front. Don't, don't hold the carrot on the stick down the road of, hey, you might be a manager one day. Give them day-to-day, hour-to-hour incentive on, 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 on earning their, wor their worth. And the other element to this is that you as a manager have to be okay with this. You're giving them the right to fail, which most places never do. You know, if you want to try to figure out to say, hey, you're putting I'm, it on them, Joe, not making it your decision. Exactly. Too. You know, I don't care if you vacuum the room first or if you make the bed first. Why would I care? Um, I, I don't care if you're doing four rooms at the same time. So you only have the vacuum on once and you're just going up and down across them all. That's irrelevant to me. What is relevant to me is that at three o'clock at check-in, do we have enough rooms of the highest quality? 
Um, so how we get there is kind of not important. And, but most people are unwilling to give people that freedom because they came up through the model of someone was yelling at me, forced me to do it their way, their way. Well, now I'm the one to control that way. And it's the worst way to run anything. When I think you say how we get there is not important, but there's efficient ways and inefficient ways to get there, right? Like with, with that hourly wage to get there, you're going to churn a ton of people. You're going to be spending more time hiring and firing and watching over other people's shoulders and worrying and wondering than you would if you created another incentive that gave you that made you pay an extra $2 an hour or something like that. But now the time and energy that you have back in your place, the security and your ability to scale. So I love how this conversation is translating so much to sales forces and sales teams mm -hmm. out there. Um, um, you know, in how you pay your employees, how you pay your sales team is so that you're not because this is huge for the workforce right now, Joe, you got all these uh, hourly employees or salary employees out there working remotely, you know, in, in this new work environment. And what is every manager's worry? They're not doing anything. Yeah. I, can't, yeah, I can't look over their shoulder. I don't know if they're working right now. I even had someone tell me that they were they had a um, they had a mouse that they had to move every um, couple of minutes just to show that they're they were working because it was they were a, a clock in piece on them. They were monitoring their their time that they're working on their computer. And so the idea is when you give somebody incentives, when you include some incentives and opportunity for them to earn more or fail. You're putting it on them, not on yourself and making it your worry. And I really like that concept. Exactly. And, and that was the more specific part I meant when I said it doesn't matter whether they how they figure out cleaning the room. Yes. Um, because you it, don't it, care how they get it done. Right. I care yeah, that yeah, yeah. they get it done. Exactly. So if exactly. the guy on the second floor is doing it different than the way they do on the first floor, it don't matter to me. As long awesome. As, you created a She created a new way. Great. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and let's listen to it. And as exactly. long as when we do the cross evaluations that it's all on the same grading scale and we're not treating them differently than them for whatever reason, you, you know, it's your company's brand. It needs to be consistent throughout, not based upon who did it. <laughs> So Joseph, I love this. This is so relevant to, to the sales conversation because the reason why it's difficult for uh, an SDR or a BDR to make this pivot to do something different, to try, you know, to try to send some personalized videos and to try to be unique and take the time is because they're still being judged on that old KPI of how many that they've got to get that number out. And if they don't get that number out, they don't keep their job, you know, well, and that, is, that's the problem with society as a large and i'll give you a different example here with football coaches you know if i if i know i'm doing the same thing as everyone else even if it's not going to work because i'm doing the same thing as everything else the owner won't fire me so for generations from the 70s until 10 minutes ago if i went for it on fourth down and i didn't get to work i'm going to get fired even though it would have been the better decision for my team and that's how most companies are still run status quo because that's how it was when I was being taught as a manager. So that's what I'm going to be to there. And at the end of the day, it is a 100% failure of the ownership to, to not be able to convey that message downhill. And we've all been in businesses where it's like, well, why didn't you just do it a little bit differently here and there? And the ones that are run by the government, I get, you're never going to change that. Like when COVID happened, um, well, not when COVID happened, every liquor store in Pennsylvania is owned by the government. So when COVID happened, there was zero innovation to figure out how to get the Jack Daniels to my house. I'm not allowed to order through Amazon and I'm not allowed in the store and they didn't care. Um, but you know, they also said that business was essential and mine wasn't. And I had a big problem with that. <laughs> but, um, as you look at it, that's a failure of the ownership. That's a failure yeah. of the, the ownership of the, of the liquor stores, in this case, the state. Where I look at what local beer distributors were doing during the COVID rolls is they had now delivery forces more than Pizza Hut. Uh, it was crazy. Um, you know, I, I'd be looking down the street, there'd be four different uh, box trucks coming by doing beer orders from different distributors no just kidding. because they wanted to, to, to keep their business running because... For, at least in Pennsylvania, in the beginning of COVID, they were only allowed to have like four people in their store. Oh, so, wow. you know, the way you got around that was, well, we're just going to load up door to door. It. It I out. love yeah. it, man. So innovation, um, y'all. Exactly. So did the, did, did all of them go through and go, 
well, if my driver does X amount of miles, he should do this many miles there. Some of them got that detailed. Most of them didn't. Most of them just got, go do your liveries and here's your paycheck. So yeah. um, in terms of compensation models, you really need to, to, to look outside the box because there's really a lot of opportunity out there since most people aren't doing it. Um, the most common ones that do do it are Google and Apple that let people have fun ways to live in their work without having to, to pay them more money. Well, that worked great until everyone worked from home. Um, now, you know, nothing's more fun than the system you have at your house, which is basically not working. I can go downstairs and watch TV. So you do have this dynamic of, I want people to do stuff that's productive, but they also now have all the distractions in the world. And yeah. the vast majority of us cannot handle distractions. And what brings us back into the game is the, if I get this done, I get paid, mm. which is vastly gamifying that dollars up. and cents for you. Gamifying that keeping little incentives. Uh, it's, it's social psychology. We, we, we forget that we need little wins and little wins to stack up to those big wins. Mm -hmm. You can't just go out and get a big win just right after you get up your couch, right? You got to get that momentum going a little bit. Absolutely. And for me, it, the worst part for me was always prospecting. Like, like yeah. That's what I always hated the most. I guess that's kind of how I get to the part where <laughs> I like negotiation and, and delivering the product. But I always hated the prospecting element. But at the end of the day, it was a necessary evil. If I don't Absolutely. have enough people, I can't give them the annuity. You know, I can't give them the life insurance product. So in my world, what I've done now is I found partners that love doing prospecting but hate talking to people in real life. So they have figured out systems that get me into the door, get me into talking to the daughter after mom died, get me talking to the landlord who doesn't want to be the landlord anymore. And, you know, that's another way that it, 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 people can think that, well, I don't really want to be a part of sales, but I'll fill up your calendar. That's an integral part of sales. 100%. Um, so that, that's another way that people can get involved in this and sometimes creating these, these lead generation companies, as I look at them, um, are simpler um, than it is to actually go out and, and own the real estate on the back end where you have to deal with the tenants. I love um, this. Joe, this has been uh, this has been an epic conversation. I actually wasn't, I, I didn't know what to expect today. You know, <laughs> I, I was curious and, uh, and uh, I came in with, uh, with some sunshine and some excitement to see what, what, what happened. And, and, and you, you uh, definitely delivered. I love this last point that you're talking about here. Um, you know, it, you, you made several points earlier, but this, I, the idea of being flexible, uh, the idea of being, um, being willing to try something outside of the box. Uh, these concepts that you talked about, the, looking for different compensation plans, knowing your skills and, and, and looking for it and not, not investing all your time and energy in what you're not good at to try to make the skill better, to learn more or, or to compensate for your lack of, of, of skill level in that area, but to delegate that skill with a partner or, or, mm -hmm. or an outsource, a resource. Um, these are all entrepreneurial and business skills that everybody needs to look at in every business. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, and I really appreciate the way you translated, uh, that from, uh, from your real estate success and, and to everything else. And so where can, where can our audience, if they've got some questions about, about getting into the real estate business, or maybe looking for a partner, or even just understanding the things that they don't know and looking for some questions, where can they follow you, Joe? Uh, well, the, the easiest way is actually just email me directly because because our, our there you team, go. I, I've done a lot of these and, and then I have a team that's strictly dedicated to fielding these types of questions and and we'll get back to you accordingly. And that's the number 412 and the word homes at gmail.com. 412 is the area code for Pittsburgh. It's not super creative. 412 <laughs> homes at gmail.com. Um, you also, as, as I mentioned, it's a very different podcast than this. It, it's Father and Joe. You, you can listen to us there. Um, we discuss a lot more of the relationship that goes behind this, how to build relationships and to make them strong and, and make them a center part of your life and a, a central part of your identity, as we discussed before. Um, so th those are the two main ways um, that, that, that people can get a hold of me, depending on which direction you want to have the conversation. Absolutely. And, and I know uh, Joseph, Joe always want, wanted to make this claim as well. And he did a very delicate job of saying Joe has a very strong relationship with God. And, you know, we, mm -hmm. I have a very spiritual uh, relationship and I don't think that, uh, you know, I think God is just a word, you know, and, and how you see him is, is your, is, is 
you know, the beauty of, 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 of the gift, you know, we all get to see him who we see him as. And so uh, you can hear, uh, yeah, I, I just, I love, I love the lessons that you brought to the table today. And, and I really appreciate your passion for, for sharing the things that uh, you have a knowledge in and a passion about to others. Yeah, absolutely. And, and on that note, not to, to get down mine, it, it's not that we're pushing a religion just to put that up front. It, no, it, yeah, it's, yeah. it's more about um, how, how you're treating others and, and you know, at the end of the day, it really comes down to the seven key things, prudence, justice, fortitude, temperance, faith, hope, and love, which at the end of the day, basically is if your neighbors had those, you would way rather your neighbor have those than not. And, and you know, learning more, being just, being willing to say what's right and self-containing, just those four by themselves um, really are what make you a better manager. They make you better at, at dealing with your clients, um, dealing with, with your personnel. Um, you know, if people know that you're going to be fair to everyone and you're not playing favorites, you're more likely to have people want to stay with you. There you, you know, go. You know, why would I work here if he's only going to pick the blonde girl? So I'm out. I was going to pick the blonde girl, to be honest with you, Joe. Sorry. <laughs> 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 I, that's just the tough luck for you. I apologize. Yeah, no, I know, no, but, but I, it's I, not really good for keeping good no, employees. I, I know, Joe. So, so that, that's I'm what just, no, I, I, I I'm just ma- I'm just making fun. <laughs> yeah. Not making fun. I'm making uh, I'm having fun. You're, uh, you're pointing out, but the problem is that's real life. Yes, you know, wh- yes, whether people is. ever want to acknowledge it or not, like that is. Listen, if you want to hire um, a person to do SDR work, I guarantee the numbers of, of a um, of an attractive blonde girl are better than um, the numbers that I get or Joe gets sending the same messages. Yeah. On a blank email, that might be true, but it doesn't yeah. mean that I'm that they're making not on profit. Marks not on, no, no, but not at <laughs> your skill level or relationship level, all the other things. But if someone just looks at a picture. It's very easy to not remember our biases. And the things about our biases is if you, you're not aware of them, they're controlling you. And so to be aware of them, you can control them or change them. And Absolutely. so, or you um, can build a robot to do them for you. Man, build, let's build a robot, man. I love the idea. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I that's what the, these bots are, aren't they? We just, we just had the uh, head of AI for the UN uh, on our, uh, doing a podcast and uh, talking about all the robots. He, he was on the original team that built Watson, Bananas. What robots are coming lately? 3D printing houses, man. This, this is a whole other world in the real estate industry that's that's bananas now, too. So much to talk about, Joe. But listen, thank you so much for bringing the game in. Thank you for bringing such a relatable conversation for, for not only those entrepreneurs and investors out there, but also for everybody in sales. That's uh, that's that's value and that uh, that all leads to growth, Joe. So uh, mm-hmm. y'all know what to do. Thank you for being here. Make sure you leave all the stars down there if you enjoyed the podcast and share it with somebody who might be interested in real estate or wants to learn a little bit of value about sales as well. Joe, thanks so much. Thank you all for being here and we'll see you on the next one.